I want to turn the floor over to Maya McGinnis, who is president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, uh, one of the most important organizations in Washington to kind of track long-term debt and deficit issues. I've asked her to come give a big picture overview of the CARES Act and other COVID-related stimulus funding, getting a sense of all the different options or all the different programs that are out there and what kind of impact that's going to have going long-term. Uh, so I want to turn it over to Maya. Maya, if you want to uh, get started and pull your, your uh, slideshow up. Nice to be with all of you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad I came in early enough to hear all of your introductions. Um, it's really nice to see kind of the geographical diversity of the whole setup here. And congratulations to all of you for being part of this. Um, I do know a couple of you, but most of you I don't know. Just a quick explanation of our organization. So the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget's been around for decades. It is bipartisan. I'm a political independent. It was created by a number of former members of Congress who were concerned about how hard it was to do fiscally responsible budgeting, um, which I should actually explain what that means. I will in a second. Um, and they wanted to sort of find a place where you could help people inside the political environment to make the hard choices that are part of responsible budgeting. Um, and the neat thing about it is the board of directors, who are all great resources, as well as our team, are people who've basically formally been in government. So run the Fed, run the Treasury, run CBO or OMB or all the big budget institutions. The co-chairs are um, Mitch Daniels, Leon Panetta, and Tim Penny, who's a former member of Congress. So I love the organization. I've been there for 15 years. I'm not sure why fiscal responsibility is a passion of mine, but it absolutely is, as is nonpartisan politics. So it's kind of um, a dream job other than the uh, terrible state of the fiscal situation in the country. Um, so I will pepper throughout this. I'll talk about fiscal policy as well, and then we'll focus a lot on what's going on and all of the response to the COVID downturn. We have a resource that I think is really helpful called COVID Money Tracker. Um, hold on, I'm gonna share my screen and actually just show it to you quickly if I can find it. Let's see, no idea what will pop up. Oh good, this is actually COVID Money Tracker. So on our website, um, which is crfb.org, you can go on and see the COVID Money Tracker. We will be launching in the next couple of weeks a much greater interactive tool. But basically this is tons of research papers, reports, and big summary tables, which I know are useful because I use them constantly to keep updated on what where we've spent all the money. Um, so here is a summary table, and then there's much more detailed tables throughout. So I think uh, that will be a good resource if any of you are actually covering what's going on in the response to COVID. Um, what else? Let's do this as a discussion now. If I'm sharing my screen, I can't see all of you at once but um, could you please feel free to unmute and jump in while I'm talking. I would much rather have a conversation throughout this. I'll leave lots of time for Q&A at the end, but much rather do it that way than have me present a whole slideshow. My hero, Alice Rivlin, who, who passed away, once told me when I was a young professional that using PowerPoints was weak and that you should be able to stand on your own conversationally. So I always feel a little guilty when I'm using a PowerPoint and would much rather turn it into a conversation. But what I want to convey through all of this is how much data there are out there. We are always happy to help you with anything. And I think it's really important to know, like when you're talking to people, we have a position, right? The Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget believes in fiscal responsibility. And how I would define that is using debt and deficits for economic reasons, not political reasons. Um, and part of why I got involved with this is when I was in my 20s is I was so concerned we were using it much more for political reasons. And I think that's only truer today than it was before. Um, it doesn't mean a commitment to a balanced budget because that's not necessarily from an economic position. It doesn't mean disliking debt. I don't love debt, but uh, it doesn't mean rejecting debt because for instance, now we're highly supportive of all the bor borrowing that needs to happen. And it doesn't have a position on big government or small government. You can be a big government fiscal, fiscally responsible person by thinking you should offset the costs of what you're doing, or a small government fiscally responsible person by thinking the way you do that is cutting spending, not taxes. We have a staff that has a variety of positions within all of those. But that's to say, that's what the issue is. Our position is supporting that, but we're also a resource. It's kind of a third part of our mission that's become more and more true recently is the commitment to using good information to make policy. 
Um, and so we will provide you any information that we can. We have a really good policy team, um, the data, and it's not always about like pushing our, our advocacy component of it. We also just think putting great data out there is really important. So this COVID money tracker um, that we put out is far more about just getting information, making it available to lawmakers, the media, and citizens across the country than pushing any one solution. Let me take you on a very quick journey about our deficits and debt. Um, when we uh, entered- Maya, could you maybe uh, put it on um, presentation view, then everybody will see it a little bit bigger. Oh, is it really small for all of you? I could. So under, under yeah, there we go, thanks. Good, having the same technical problems I have when we do them in person too, where I can never quite get it to work. Okay, so um, just to frame the issue, the way I think about this is we entered this terrible moment with a much larger deficit in debt than we should have had. Um, and that means we had already hit a moment where deficits were basically a trillion dollars a year forever. We um, had borrowed so much that our debt was the highest it had ever been in this country other than right after World War II. And we entered this downturn with debt as a share of GDP twice as high as it was when we entered the recession of 2008. All of that is problematic because normally what you want to do is when times are good and your economy is expanding, you want to take the measures to get your fiscal situation under control so that you have lots of borrowing space and capacity when you have emergencies like we have right now. Instead, we spent the fast past five years uh, with tax cuts and spending increases, none of which were offset. Congress passed and the president signed into law an additional $5.1 trillion in new borrowing during the expansion which left us in a more fiscally precarious situation than we would otherwise have been in. And so that's phase one. Phase two is where we are now. All of that is frustrating, uh, especially to a group like ours, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be borrowing now and we should be borrowing a lot. And we'll talk about how we're doing that and all the resources there. But this is exactly the moment when you do want to borrow, you obviously can't put your economy into a coma without providing the life support of fiscal stimulus to basically serve as a bridge loan uh, or bridge grant until we're on firmer ground and then help with recovery measures. And then finally, when all of that is done, we'll have to turn back to fiscal issues. But so here is um, here is just kind of a where we've been on the fiscal deficit, and you can see it bumped up to a point that is the highest level of deficit that, you, that we've ever had, um, and where it compares to what the projections were um, pre-COVID pre disaster. And so while it's a massive uptick now, it is projected to return um, significantly higher, but closer to parallel where it was before. But all of this assumes that there won't be another round of economic measures, and there almost certainly will be. So these numbers will end up being much worse, right? And you know, continuing somewhere around here. Um, again, I can't. I can only see a couple of you, so if there are questions, please jump in. Um, then there's the debt numbers. I think you'll hear lots of ways about conveying deficits and debt uh, and think and choose how you want to do it. I think debt as a share of GDP is the most useful measure. Um, I also think when you're reporting that one of the best things that you can do is find ways to make trillions and even billions accessible, which they really aren't. We have a tool, we have a bunch of different tools on our website because I find them helpful and I think they, they've been a popular thing with people who come to them. but. One of them is just very simple called Is It Worth It? where we try to keep track of all the existing government spending and then all the policies that are kind of in the queue for discussion, both on the spending and tax side, and then break it out per person, per taxpayer, per household. I think that's a really useful way to look at uh, the costs of things to make it more accessible. So you may want to go to that at some point as well, Is It Worth It tool. Um, but what it shows is that the debt relative to the economy, again, that important that important metric is the highest it's ever been other than here. But the key is that after World War II, it was incredibly simple to bring the debt back down because there was a huge burst in growth. That is not something we're gonna have now, not just because of the recession, but because demographics have changed. And with the aging of the boomer, baby boomers and people moving into retirement, uh, growth numbers are gonna be much lower and it will be very, very hard to bring our debt down. In fact, it's projected to grow forever. The reason that those of us in this business say the debt is unsustainable 
is because it's growing faster than the economy that cannot last forever. That was true when the economy was good. It's going to be much more true when, uh, when we have to deal with the aftermath of what we're going through right now. Quickly, because I want to turn to COVID, um, it's just why, you know, this is a really tough issue to connect to people's lives, depending on the kind of reporting you're interested in, the stories that show how it connects to people's lives are useful, but it's not as simple as kind of saying if this were a household budget. That's a, that's a useful key, but you want to make clear that it's not completely parallel, because of course the government has the ability to tax, whereas households don't have the ability to increase their income uh, whenever they choose to. But the, the downside of irresponsible fiscal policies are the economic effects that can slow economic growth, um, the budgetary effects that lead to interest payments that are, high, that are higher than they otherwise would be, and that pushes out whether you're a small government tax cutter or a big government spender, um, money going in interest has that first claim on every dollar. Responding to a crisis, the fiscal space situation, which means we have no idea when we could have macroeconomic pushback effects or lowering demand in, in demand for treasuries or a variety of things um, that make it harder to borrow during a crisis. The U.S., of course, is in a unique position because we are the safe haven. The worse things get, the more people want our debt. That will not be true forever. Obviously, there are countries around the world who would prefer that relationship to be more spread out, not have this unipolar situation. Um, and if the U.S. keeps being as irresponsible as we are, we lose the advantage of being the safe haven. So that the, the more you take advantage of a benefit like that, the shorter the time horizon until you lose it. One of the things I really worry about um, is the missed opportunities and that when you think about where the globe, country, um, and economy are headed, the, the one thing we know for sure is that the pace of change, the massive pace of change, is faster than we've ever seen before, whether driven first by globalization, but now really by technology, and then these huge external shocks, which we're living through right now, and the way the world feels, it feels like they're happening all the time. Um, we are not able to have a budget that is flexible and nimble and all the things that you would want to say like, okay, the world has changed massively. What should we think about? Maybe um, one that I'm, I'm pretty interested in is lifelong learning. It's pretty clear, the older you get, as I'm finding regularly, the less you know of relevant information. It's not like it was when, when you know, decades ago when you didn't really need to keep updating your knowledge base to do your job. You absolutely do now, but we don't have the resources available because so much of our budget is locked in to even have a serious national discussion about what kinds of things should we be launching. Um, we should do that in conjunction with how to reform our safety net because we have a lot of problems in our safety net already. There's generational unfairness. I've got teenagers. I frankly, having been locked in a house with them for however long it is, don't care if we leave them $20 trillion of debt. I think they're late. They're like both asleep still. But in general, one does think it's not the right thing to borrow a whole lot of money, not pay for the spending that you're doing, and leave that bill to your kids uh, because you don't like paying for things. And while that's oversimplifying, not much. The reason we borrow so much these days is for political reasons, not economic reasons, and it's massively unfair to the next generation. And then there's the eventual risk of a, a fiscal crisis, which could show up in interest rates or inflation or quite likely the loss of confidence in the dollar. So there you are. That's the fiscal situation, but really what's going on is that this is a moment for massive borrowing. And so if we go to this COVID money tracker that I mentioned to you, this is where you can really take all the data and you can slice and dice as many things as you're interested in finding. And I hope you guys will play around it with it and find it useful. The major things that we're tracking are, we've bucketed them in lots of ways, but there's many activities that are going on. There's the Fed, uh, which is massive in the scale of intervention. Legislative actions, which are also not only massive, but unprecedented in how fast they have been and the administrative actions, which um, taxes are due tomorrow, I believe, but which one of them was shifting out the time um, of when taxes would be paid, much smaller overall in their effect, as one would expect. And this also shows how much money has been put into the economy um, and how much has been authorized. And then the deficit impact is also important under legislative actions because much of what has gone out uh, will be repaid. So the deficit will not be increased by as much as the total amount of dollars authorized. Any jumping in? Okay. 
I will uh, trust you guys to jump. Yeah, Maya, if you, if you could just explain for me on the legislative actions bar, um, it, it goes up to 3.6 trillion, but the deficit impact is only 2.4. Why is that? Oh, sorry, that's what I just said, that we are authorizing a lot of things, some of which will be paid back. So a lot yeah, of the yeah. grants will be repaid. Um, so we authorize a greater amount of money than will ultimately show up in the deficit. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks. No, no, that's okay. But a lot of the decision has been, I mean, these are trade-offs with loans and grants, right? Um, a grant means you're never going to make up that money. It's impossible to have people have to pay that back. The grant is facilitating your ability to hopefully keep your business open or to deal with the hardships that are there. Um, the loans are important for creating the right incentives because as we've seen in all the PPP gotcha stories, you don't want to be giving money to people who um, it creates the, the wrong incentive to take it. Loans mean you have to have to think about whether it's actually a worthwhile investment. One of the risks that we have from a very low interest rate environment, which we're living in now, is it's allowed us to keep up a lot of probably unprofitable businesses, zombie, zombie businesses and industries. And so um, low interest rates or overly generous grants can all create that environment. So you're trying to balance the, the pressure there. But de definitely the tendency has been more towards grants during this, I think, understandably and rightly. Hey, Maya, this is Julie. I just had a question on, and you addressed it a little bit just then, but how are you coming up with the number of whether people are going to be able to pay these back because that's been a big issue in our state. Uh, yeah, so we're doing as little projecting of our own as possible. A lot of times for the work that we do, we don't make many assumptions ourselves because we want people to be able to take the data as they are. So this is how the programs are structured and then how the Congressional Budget Office is projecting it. We're not projecting because who knows, right? We have no idea where this economy is headed. I think it's like the WWW is my fear and guess that it's going to be up and down and up and down and up and down for a long time. But we wouldn't, we, we would undermine our ability to put out data if we were also projecting. So for that reason, this is based on CBO assumptions, which are kind of mid-level recovery and based on the programs, um, what the, what the, how the programs are structured, not who might default. Good question. Because the number will definitely be different. Alva, you had a question I saw in came in the chat. Now, just asking if um, the PPP loans are forgivable loans, correct? Yes, they are. Those are grants. Okay. Many cases. Okay. As long as you meet certain criteria about generally focused on employment, yes. Okay, thank you. Another way that we thought would be useful to slice and dice this is the kind of things that are going out the door. And again, it shows you how some things are going so quickly compared to other things um, which are much more slow. And this, there's no real surprises here, but I even think going through this tool can give you ideas of different stories to write, right? Because there's so many different ways you can think about what we're doing here. And so there's a lot of um, information in all of these that you can cut into and learn more about where the money's going. This to me is the one that I kind of find most useful to continue to get the overview, but of the money that has come out through these different components of the big buckets of, of where the agency, where the money is coming from. Um, and of course, the big thing here is the CARES Act and one assumes, you can see if I'm doing the mouse, right? Yeah. So the CARES Act and one assumes that there will be another, another package here that I'm certainly assuming will focus on state and local governments. The reason that's necessary um, is, of course, because of their balanced budget requirements. And so there's so many furloughs and losses of services that could come out of this, which would both cause the hardships that you want to avoid and the contractionary effects in the economy that you want to avoid. So when you're thinking about all of these measures, there's the three, three T's of stimulus, which is timely, temporary, and targeted. Um, Temporary is what every politician tries to get rid of if it's a policy they like, right? They want to use this as a chance to be uh, make brand new sweeping policies that are temp that are um, permanent. Timely is something we really succeeded at in these first rounds. It was remarkable how quickly the money got out the door. What I found a little less remarkable is how difficult it was to get money to people. Here's a story. Every time I say here's a story, it's probably been written a million times, but I haven't seen it that really looks into how um, in a world of such 
technological innovation and things have become digitized so effectively, we still have a really difficult time of connecting benefits to recipients in a timely way for a huge group of the population um, and, and for most people, in fact, and for businesses. And so the fact that we're not as LinkedIn connected, um, I was kind of struck by when you're thinking if people really can't pay, pay rent or buy food and suddenly you're locked in your home, you need money now. I thought um, it was amazing how timely and quickly we got the entire package completed, but I still find it worrisome that we can't get money to move around the economy more quickly. That said, as soon as I say that, I'm convinced our next crisis could be a currency, a cryptocurrency crisis. So the more you digitize these things, the more the risk is. And one of the big issues we've learned from all of this is the importance of resilience and the dangers of frictionless economy. So while I'm on one hand saying we should have more linkages so you can get money to people's pockets, there are huge risks that go, go hand in hand with that. Um, so that's just an observation of mine. This is a different way we thought we'd go ahead and show where all the money is going. Um, and so uh, the loan, oh, oh, here's actually helpful. So the loans, which are much larger than the grants, um, but I think a lot of those loans will end up being forgiven. And that's why there's so much wiggle room in that question of how that will play out, excuse me, the money that's paid back or not, that deficit impact of the legislative components. And then another way to look at it is who the recipients were. Uh, a lot of people have played this as, you know, only kind of a bailout of Wall Street. Small businesses were intended to be um, and have successfully been a pretty major component of the recipients. Oh, and I'm sorry, I didn't finish back on my three T's, timely, temporary, and targeted. We did so well and timely, but I think now with a little more breathing room, we're going to see pay lawmakers correctly focusing more on targeted. So the first thing was like, get that money out into the economy as quickly as possible. Mistakes will be made. Frankly, if they're not made, it means we're not going fast enough. Um, that's just kind of one of the, the byproducts of doing something very quickly. You can't like write in the nuances and the details of how to target it. But going forward, we'll have more time to think about how to target the money so that it goes to the places either most in need or with the highest multipliers, where every dollar in the economy has the chance to return the most to the economy. And you want to figure out what those things are. Unsurprisingly, politicians will always disagree on what they are and find that the biggest multiplier is on whatever their favorite use of a dollar is. Anyhow, um, one desire I have is to have kind of a, another CBO-like institution um, that pops up and helps us figure out the economic returns of a lot of different policies on spending and stimulus so that policymakers could be guided by more information. Um, CBO, by the way, is my Bible of an institution. I think it's the greatest resource you could find in terms of really trying to put great information out there. There's, in fact, a CBO report that caused me to pursue this career. I was working on Wall Street, read a CBO report, and became obsessed with it because I thought it was like such great reading. So I think that institution is incredibly useful. Um, and I had a brief, a brief detour in my career where I just for two months went and worked on an editorial board to fill in for somebody who was writing a book. And whenever I didn't know what to write about in the economy, I would go read CBO reports or Federal Reserve, the banks across the countries, their research reports. And I found so many good ideas for um, editorials that I would write. So those, those are just some of the institutions I find really useful in all of this. Another way of breaking out who is receiving the support, I'm going to go quickly because I want to stop talking and have you all talk more. Um, this just compares sort of uh, how much went out in the Great Recession versus now. Um, but again, what has happened is we have put this money into the economy so incredibly quickly. This is um, the likes of which we've never seen, right? This is a massive amount of stimulus in a very short amount of time. What we don't have is a huge amount expected in subsequent years. And again, who knows what this recovery will look like and what is needed. But if things get ugly, then this will definitely have to be extended or added to, augmented. And those all those fiscal numbers that I discussed earlier will be in much worse shape. Um, another interesting thing to think about, 
what is the story with all this debt? Where is it going? We're issuing unprecedented levels of debt. I pour over every month the monthly, monthly treasury numbers to see what's going on in the auctions. I wish there were better data about who's buying the debt in more granular, but it is going out there incredibly quickly. Um, so far, the Fed has basic, basically been absorbing the debt, not because it's buying it because it needs to necessarily, but because it was trying to provide a lot of liquidity into the economy that may change. So basically our situation is that about 40% of our debt is owned and purchased by uh, countries overseas. Um, and then the rest is divided by our Fed and um, domestic savers, lenders. Um, and there's always the questions of if and when demand for U.S. Treasuries will start to contract. That has happened. It's gone down from 50% to 40% over the past years. And obviously countries around the world are all dealing with their own COVID problems. So savings may be drawn down in general. This will be a really important relationship to follow and to try to understand what effects the Fed of, of the Fed purchasing so much of our debt is going to have more broadly and in the long run. So it's a really interesting story taking us into unprecedented territory. Anyone who tells you they fully understand it or knows what it means or what it's going to bode for the future is probably not telling you the truth. This is just a let's hope this makes sense and we have no there's so many possible economic outcomes. It's very hard to know how it'll play out. I think it makes sense if if I were making the call, I would do what's going on, but we are in risky and unknown territory. So that's um that's another wrinkle into the story what will happen next. And so um and that's actually a really interesting point that you need a Fed and you need fiscal policy and monetary policy, both of which are working on these issues. Um, and I think the work of the Fed has been greatly complicated in past years because fiscal policy has been so irresponsible. So the Fed has had to take over that in many ways. And now you have a dynamic where there's so much debt in the U.S. that if and when the Fed raises interest rates, and it would be great to be in a situation where that were, that were on the horizon, we won't be there anytime soon, but if and when it does, it means that the interest payments on the U.S. debt will be really problematic and could have very adverse effects on the economy. So while the Fed's trying to strengthen the economy in whatever part of the business cycle we're in, our uh, weakened fiscal policy situation, I think, makes that all the more challenging. Um, so then there's, there's no more slides here. This is just the general point that once we get through all of this, um, hold on now. I just want to figure out how I get back to you guys. Stop sharing. Once, okay, great. Uh, once we get through all this, we will have to turn our attention on to the fiscal issues. The thing about when you see the effects of fiscal policy is nobody knows. It's kind of like an invisible dog fence that if you walked into it, you wouldn't see it was about to happen. It could be too late. You want to get your fiscal situation under control, uh, before you're forced to. So that means as soon as the economy is strong enough and you've moved first from putting a lot of money in the economy, then into waiting to hope that recovery takes. Once it has and it's strong enough, what we didn't do last expansion, and we should and I hope we will, but I'm also pessimistic about our political environment these days, will be to pivot then and focus on the fiscal issues. That gets you into the basic policies that lawmakers love to run away from, but raising taxes, reducing spending, fixing Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid, all of which have growth trajectories that are much higher than the overall economy. Plenty of ways to fix those. Can be on the spending side, can be on the tax side. Saying you need to fix them doesn't in any way say how you should fix them. But not delaying on those things will all be um, part of a package. Ideally, you'd put a package in place that makes those decisions as soon as possible and then phases them in very gradually. Um, with the recovery. A lot of people are talking about automatic stabilizers and triggers so that, for instance, unemployment insurance could keep going until the economy is strong enough. Um, I kind of am going to work on the same idea for doing that for fiscal responsibility, where once the economy is strong enough, can we automatically start to phase in these things that would help fix the situation? Okay, hit me with questions, please. Hey, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, Johnny Edwards with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. 
What happens if the uh, debt does continue to outpace the economy? If that were to go on unsustained, what's the worst case scenario? Well, the worst case scenario is that our, it tanks our economy, either through soaring interest rates, which grow our interest payments to the point where it pushes out all the other things in the budget, particularly the investments that we have shortchanged in the past years, and there isn't room to put more money into those investments, which all leads to slower economic growth. Um, like uh, another scenario is high inflation, right? So, so many, many people aren't that scared of inflation right now because they haven't seen it. I'm old enough to remember gas lines in the 70s and the fact that you suddenly have a huge loss of the value of your savings. So high levels of inflation could certainly hit this economy. Um, deflation in the short run is probably more of a worry, but in the longer run, this is like playing this scenario out. Um, and I think what's certainly becoming more likely is the loss of the strength of the dollar, which is something that benefits us immensely. And we are in a situation right now as the safe haven where there is demand for our treasuries, which allows us the, the ability to borrow when we need to, to not be concerned that we'll have a fiscal crisis in this country. But if you lose our role as the safe haven, that becomes more challenging and unlikely. Um, you don't have a default here like you do in other countries that borrowed in their own currency. We can always pay our debts. The problem is that paying our debts as they spiral can create wreak havoc on the economy or push out your other priorities. Frankly, I think the biggest risk is the one that's unseen. And it is that because of our fiscal situation and because it comes from so much, I mean, I really look at our national debt as a symptom of how polarized our political environment is. But because the national debt um, it is reflective of the huge disagreements between the left and the right on how you should divide resources and how you should pay for resources. I think the ultimate effect is that our budget does not reflect the priorities that keep the economy strong in the longer run. And it's not strategic. It's not long run focused. It does a terrible job of what we should be doing, which is compromising between competing needs and priorities and values of a very diverse country that has hugely varying preferences for what its government would do. Those are all the things that I kind of reflect the, think reflect the brokenness of government. But the real problem is it means our economy will not grow the way it otherwise would have. Resources on the national level will become more constrained. And frankly, that just adds to all the tension that already exists between huge divides and resentments that we've been seeing over the past years. A, a growing economy makes all of these more difficult things easier to fix. A not growing economy definitely shrinks to the anger. Maya, could you give an example of where it's not strategic, where you're saying it's not aligning with what we want? Yeah, my 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 favorite in a perverse backwards way would be how much money do we think the federal government should be spending on kids or investments and how much is it actually doing so, right? Um, the fact that we have under, I mean, I guess the biggest one for me is human capital. Um, the underinvestment in uh, a mass of amount of making sure that from birth to death, we are continuing to develop our brains, our knowledge, our ability to work in an economic environment that will help the economy grow. Um, and instead focusing so much on consumption, whether it's portions of Healthcare that go to overspending. I mean, I really get frustrated with how our health, how inefficient our healthcare spending is, and that has to do with so many entrenched interests in it. But healthcare or defense or immediate spending or social security benefits for me when I'm old enough to get them, which I, is that will be consumption when I don't necessarily need them as much as I would like to see more investment in my kids. That was I started to personalize that too much, but I think it should be a long run focus of how are we putting our money into things that will help the country be stronger, not in the next political cycle, which is what I think we're focused on. Strategic also, I'd throw in an area I'm much less knowledgeable in, but I think the way we're spending our defense budget is completely back looking what were the risks before and completely missing the boat on what risks are going to be coming at us. And back to that really important theme that you've heard so much about, but resilience. We need to be building in for a lot of risks. I think our economy, I think the focus on efficiency and frictionlessness has 
made us lose the ability to be prepared for different uncertainties, which are unlikely, but as we're seeing right now, devastating if they come along. And so I think we're going to have to shift our economy there. Um, I, I think worker retraining is just absolutely huge. I mean, the pace at which things are going to become irrelevant is terrifying. And we need a workforce that is constantly having more opportunities, not feeling like what they do has become obsolete and so they're in trouble. But again, responsible budgeting isn't like what I think or what you think or what someone else thinks. It's the fact that we all have different thoughts on this. And then how do you have a budget process that actually reconciles those differences? And the fact that what we have in this country is no budget more often than we do, like we barely pass the budget. I think you guys all probably know this, but most people forget it. We fail to pass a budget most years. And most of our programs are just kind of on automatic pilot with very little oversight of whether they're working. This is for spending and also for tax expenditures, which is a trillion dollars a year in tax breaks that are not evaluated how they're working. So I think that lack of oversight is also um, ref demonstrates how not strategic it is. Maya, shouldn't we be focusing on uh, efficiency and is there something wrong with looking at uh, frictionless uh, and paying attention to that? You know, I mean, one of one of the tests of you one's self, sort of their ability for growth is when you look at yourself and figure out what things you have called wrong or been wrong on. I definitely think I have like been on the Bible of efficiency for a lot of my career. Like how can we, things be more, I play games with my kids. What's the most efficient way to get from this point to your soccer practice? Like I thought efficiency meant so much. Um, and of course it does because it's critical for growth, but what it shouldn't do is not evaluate the risks of different things. And I don't mean to be overselling this moment because we're in a pandemic that we could have been more prepared for and we weren't. And I don't mean to say that you should have ventilators that are stored by the gazillions in case you might need them. But I think thinking about, um, and I think globalization is a really interesting component of this, but thinking about the things that we've done for efficiency, but that have left us not as prepared for um, if there's a scarcity of resources, if you have your economic and your geopolitical interests aren't aligned, I think you have to think through those things. So I think it's a, gr a big moment for us and the whole world rethinking how you balance the quest for efficiency and that for security. Hi, Maya. Um, I was wondering if you could give us a little explanation on how the rising national debt and some of the issues that you've explained affect states' ability to borrow and craft their own budget, as well as how state debt and borrowing impacts the national equation? Yeah, great question and one that'll be really relevant in the next few weeks as they start to hammer out the details of what the next package will look like. And the reason that um, we are so supportive of borrowing during this downturn is because states in general, for the most part, are unable to borrow, whereas the federal government can. Um, I think the states not borrowing probably makes sense, given the sort of um, experience we've seen in that how between politics and economics, politics tends to win out. Um, and of course, states do have capital budgets, so they are able to borrow for a lot of their capital expenditures. That is, by the way, the right way to budget, borrow for investment, but not for consumption. The risk that one has is that uh, everybody labels everything investment. Right. You know, oh, my favorite agricultural or cultural insurance program, that's investment. My favorite um, credit for restaurants, that invest I mean, like it's really hard to to trust what is declared as investment. But the notion of a capital budget makes an awful lot of sense. The federal government, on the other hand, can borrow um, and it can borrow basically unconstrained. The only limit there is in borrowing is our debt ceiling. The debt ceiling has a long history and it used to make a lot more sense. What happened um, in more recent times is that it started to get weaponized where people said, I'm not going to lift it. I'd rather have a default. And once you reach that point, you have now taken your budgetary constraint and turned it into a dangerous weapon because defaulting, which, by the way, is different than a government shutdown. I know you guys know that, but everybody confuses the two, including lawmakers. Um, and a default could be potentially utterly devastating and ruin our ability to borrow for years and years and years and years. 
and given how dependent we are on borrowing, that has huge ramifications. Um, but so there's really no limit on the federal borrowing. And that is bad in terms of the creep, creep, sort of eating away at our fiscal situation, but it sure is good at a moment like this. And so it makes sense that what we have is a relationship where the federal government can borrow and give that money to the states to figure out where they need it the most and how to spend it the most. And I tend to be a supporter of the notion that every state actually has a lot of different ways that make sense to spend the money, given how different the experiences different states are having right now. Um, but raising that money at the federal level and dispersing it and allowing the states to figure out how to spend it is actually a really good model for how you fight a recession. Um, there is also the huge risk that states get a very good portion of money from their federal government in good times as well as bad. There is a real risk that when we have fiscal consolidation or finally deal with the deficit and debt, money that goes to the states will get tighter. I, I do also think there's a missing, a miss mindset, which is if states want to do something, not now because it's a downturn, you shouldn't do this, but they can raise taxes. There has been a mindset that states can't raise taxes and so the federal government has to allocate lots of money to them because they can't possibly pay for them and there'll be a huge squeeze on education, which is true because of the health care pushing education spending out. Um, whereas I think states are going to have to become more used to the fact there'll be some high tax states and some low tax states and that reflects the preferences of the politicians and the and the residents of the states and I think that makes sense. Um, but I think ultimately we'll move more towards states being a little bit more self-financed. No, I don't know if I think that's true. I think that's a, there's a good chance that will happen. But for right now, the model in this moment that the federal government borrows and that the states don't, it makes a lot of sense to have one entity where the borrowing and decisions about fiscal expansion can take place. One other reason that matters is when you think about how much you should borrow, um, when you think about how you respond to a moment like this, basically politicians, someone says, I think we should spend 500 billion. That number is pulled out of nowhere. Someone else says, well, I care much more. I think we should spend a trillion. Someone else says, well, I care the most. We should spend two trillion. And it's like not anchored in anything. What it should be anchored is in is where your potential GDP is compared to your actual GDP. You want to look at the output gap or the output loss that's in your economy from the recession. And then you want to craft a package, one that has those multipliers I mentioned before as high as possible and two fills in the right amount of the gap. We kind of budget, stimulus budget, I guess from top down, like politicians saying how much they want um, rather than what is the economy need at the exact moment. But if you have one entity like the federal government doing that rather than 50, then you're actually more likely to get it in a perfect world aligned with what the economy actually needs. Okay, it's, um, it's 11.58. We have time for one more quick question and quick answer if somebody has one. I just wanted to follow up real quick on that point you just made. The, does the CBO do a good job of making the estimate of what is accurate uh, in, in terms of that estimate you're talking about? Okay, so the CBO projects a whole lot of things. It does a very good job in terms of not bringing bias to it. Uh, there'll be some people who disagree. There's some really interesting oversight um, hearings on CBO, I think it was last year, maybe a year and a half ago, I testified in one of them and I read all of the, the testimonies. They were really good. Um, the C, so there are some people who think the models will be biased one way or another. The great example is dynamic scoring, which has gone on for tax cuts. To what extent do tax cuts generate more in the economy? That argument will start to happen on the spending side. To what extent does certain spending pay for itself? When someone says pay for yourself, please roll your eyes. Nothing pays for itself. I mean, like a couple dollars here and there, but nothing in the billions does. But it can help grow the economy. So the CBO helping to figure out what creates the most economic growth is a place where people say, oh, it's not developed enough. And that's true. It needs to be continuing to develop. But the main answer is absolutely. The CBO puts out the best impartial projections. They're not predictions because they recognize lots of things will change along the way. But given the data that there is and the current law, they look at current law. A lot of times we know that current law doesn't reflect what will happen. For instance, the big tax cuts we passed a few years ago, a bunch of those things are going to expire. It is highly unlikely that every one of those dollars will actually expire. So sometimes CBO will look at the current law, which has them all expiring, and the current policy that assumes a lot of things that were put in place temporarily, 
but really politicians want them to continue will. Tax extenders is another example of that. Um, and the CBO doesn't predict recessions or the business cycle because it's too hard, so they kind of average it out. Um, so there's tons of qualifiers as there would be in this, but absolutely, CBO is like this institution that's really critical because it's not a part of the political process. Number of countries around the world have tried to build their own CBOs, and when I've traveled, um, I hear routinely sort of how ours is so good because it's not politicized. One of my deep fears for the moment is that too many of our institutions will become more politicized. But I rely on the CBO for um, all of our work, and I think what they put out is really, really good, really well done, and they continue to kind of be introspective about it. So they'll look at both the fan chart of how different variable shifts might change the outcomes, and they'll also look back and see how good their projections were. So please use the CBO as a resource. Like I said, those Fed banks, if you're looking for stories, is really important. Treasury data is really good. Anybody who wants resources for things can always reach out to us. We are happy to direct you to the same resources we use. And our website has a lot of both these tools, but we will put out papers on basically every fiscal thing that happens, president's budget, congressional budgets, trustees for Social Security and Medicare, um, the presidential contenders plans. We have a program called U.S. Budget Watch where we will look at what their promises, how they would cost, what they would do. Um, and like I said, while we care about fiscal responsibility, we really try to be absolutely as impartial as possible. And I, I know we have succeeded in getting a good reputation as unbiased reporting. So we can give you a lot of links and I would put our own website on there for every, every fiscal moment as having a lot of useful stuff. So sign up for CRFB.org and we will get it to you.